Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm not Amanda, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, I'm James Dell. Uh, I am the head of media at Singularity University. And before I bring Amanda up, I wanted to really quickly just kind of explain what we have been calling the engagement dilemma uh, at Singularity. Um, so let's see if this works. Cool. No, oh, no. We're going to run through it backwards now. Okay, cool. So for those of you who don't know Singularity University, uh, we've been around for about 10 years. Uh, I've been there for about a year now. Uh, and Singularity University is a group uh, that works on helping organizations, people, uh, governments, uh, and uh, other collectives try to understand the future. So we do in-person courses, we do uh, summits all over the world, uh, and we also run a bunch of media properties, which is what my job is there. So if you've ever been to futurism.com, uh, that is a website that we run. And I've been thinking about this engagement problem for a while. So before I dive into what I'm calling the engagement dilemma, I think it would be helpful to understand what engagement is. So what is an engaged audience? Well, this is exactly what it looks like. I can tell that about, I don't know, 80, 75% of you uh, are actually engaged, right? You're looking at me, I can make eye contact with you if I kind of look around the room. There are some people who are on their phones, but engagement is something that we as humans all just inherently understand. We know when someone's listening to us and we know when someone's not listening to us. There are a ton of different ways to measure this. There's kind of that, that inherent, I can just tell from looking at it way, but businesses use ways of you know, eye tracking and, and store tracking uh, when you're actually in an environment where, where someone wants to know, is this person engaged with my products or not? Uh, and the internet, of course, has given us a whole bunch of ways of measuring engagement, right? So we're thinking about Facebook, likes, shares, impressions, views. These metrics have been kind of pitched to us as a way to know whether or not someone is engaging with a piece of content, which is good to know, but it's somewhat flawed. And, and I'll explain why that's flawed in a second. But if you look at this chart here, you'll see that on Facebook, the more fans or likes you have, your engagement rate actually goes down. Now, why is that? Well, when you're working in this digital environment, a company like Facebook is actually um, incentivized to charge you money when they have someone who is engaged with your products. And so, because their business model is built on that level of engagement, uh, it makes sense that the larger you are, the more money they're gonna wanna charge you in order to get those engagement levels up. Um, this is not a new idea. This is an article from 2014 uh, that I was quoted in uh, that kind of explains this idea back when I was at Gawker Media, where I said, effectively, Facebook is pulling off a grift. They're saying that we are going to allow you to buy all of these likes for your brand or your company. You'll be, have this engaged audience. And then once you have all of those fans who you are now allowed to engage with, we're going to turn that around and tell you that you have to pay more money to reach the people that you just paid to get onto your page, right? And so we've built this system where engagement, at least when we measure it in the digital world, is now being held by these gatekeepers like Google and Facebook. Now, what we've been thinking about at Singularity University is there are actually a lot of different ways to measure engagement. Engagement isn't simply a like or a share or an impression on a website. Engagement matters in your stores, it matters in your office, it matters in your classroom. Engagement is something that goes far deeper than knowing whether or not someone clicked on something or if, if someone's eye kind of tracked past a certain point. We, we have you know, uses for those, but uh, we at Singularity University uh, and Uncommon Partner Labs, uh, which Amanda will get into in a second, have worked on a solution to start tracking engagement in a way that actually goes into the human brain and starts looking at, is this person actually focused on the thing that we're looking at or the, the product that we want to engage the person with? And so while all of the different engagement measurement techniques, clicks, likes, eye tracking, are useful, the one thing that 
those all measure are kind of um, it's kind of backwards looking as opposed to predictive. And so what we'd like to get to is a place where we can't just make something and hope that it gets engagement or see if it gets engagement or not. We'd like to know going into a piece of content being created, a product being created, if what we've made is actually going to be engaging. So I'd like to bring up Amanda now to kind of talk a little bit more about how this technology that we've developed actually gets used. Uh, and then once uh, this is all over, I think there's a break after this, we'll be outside demoing the headset that we use uh, and we'd love to show you how it works and uh, give you some deeper insights. So without any further ado, Amanda from Uncommon Partner Labs, come on up. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Mana. I've also been at SU about a year. Um, we, Uncommon Partners was acquired by SU to help build products and partnerships um, to help the community take everything they've learned and start to take action on impacting the future. And a lot of what we do is really rooted in behavioral science. Um, and so I'd like to tell you a story about some work that my co-founder Kyle Nell and I did at Lowe's Home Improvement where we ran the innovation group. And we did a lot of work starting in 2012 uh, with augmented and virtual reality, looking at how we could apply that at Lowe's to everything from visualization of a home improvement project to collaborative design to DIY skills training across six or seven different mixed reality platforms. And what was happening in the really early days with virtual reality was people would come in our stores, they would try this experience, they were designing a bathroom, and they would take off the headset and they would say, wow, that's really cool. And so this went on for about six months and the feedback was so positive that all of our store managers and our executives were like, this is awesome. When are we gonna put this in 1800 stores? But we knew that it wasn't ready yet because what was happening is for every person who said, oh, that's cool, they were slowly walking away. And what we were able to see because we were looking at what was happening in their brains is that while they told us it was cool, they were actually very overwhelmed and we knew that they weren't really likely to use that again. And so that gets at this problem that James is discussing, which is when you're building something new, how do you really know if something is working or not? And most of the ways that we have traditionally measured or researched these types of questions have relied on an assumption that people know why they do the things that they do. But we know that that's not the case. And so we've been looking at applied neuroscience as a really critical part of what we do when we're building new products or experiences so that we can pair that with what people tell us and this actually becomes pretty predictive of likely behavior. And so what we do is we put people in EEG headsets um, and also have them wear eye tracking goggles. Sometimes we look at their heart rate and we're having them go through different experiences. The EEG headset is obviously decades old technology, but what's happening now with advancements in machine learning and then also with sensor data is that we're able to get a much more complete picture of what's happening inside of someone's head and really give you more actionable insights as a result. And so this is a, a journey of, of what we went through at Lowe's. So what I was speaking of, um, you know, really started back from our earliest tests in Canada. And so over this time, we tested Oculus versus HoloLens versus smartphone-based AR versus the actual just physical vignettes that you would find in a Lowe's store if you went in and, and looked at an old kitchen. And we created the world's largest database of brainwave data of people using AR and VR technologies. And over time, that allowed us to make comparisons between things that are inherently not comparable. Um, and that allowed us to be looking for metrics like cognitive workload. Are you bored or are you stressed out? We're looking at things like motivation and engagement, which typically you'd like to see that pretty high, but in some cases that can actually indicate a fear response. Um, and then we also look at your actual attention, um, visual attention, uh, eye tracking and heat mapping where you're actually looking so we can pair that back with what's happening in the brain. And so because we were looking at this over time, we were able to recognize certain points when the technology was developing and when we were ready to scale. So for example, our earliest tests were in virtual reality, so wearing a fully enclosed headset. And we had people designing the bathroom, as I mentioned. And while we did see that this was really powerful for visualization and helping people have confidence to start a project because they could see what it would look like at the end, when it came to collaborating and designing in this environment, it was very overwhelming because of the 
number of decisions that you had to make and trying to collaborate in this new environment. Um, and that's where we saw really that, that people were getting overwhelmed. When we got to um, the advancement of what you would now consider like AR Kit or AR Core, the augmented reality platforms in an iPhone or Android phone, we were able to see that all of a sudden we were at this sweet spot of engagement where people are not bored, they are engaged, but they're not overwhelmed, and we knew that right there is where we wanted them to be. And that's when we were able to say to Lowe's, like, now we are ready to scale. And it doesn't have to be scale in hardware, but it was scale in development resources to build the applications that live on your phone that today are now integrated into the Lowe's consumer app. But because we were tracking that all along the way, we were really ready to make that decision uh, when the opportunity arose. At the same time, we saw that when people were learning in virtual reality, it was very, very impactful, about 40% better in learning a task than just looking at a YouTube video, which was our next best um, offering at the time. And that's a stat that's been independently repeated by a number of other organizations doing VR training for everything from athletes to machinery. Um, so we know that that really immersive environment um, and the ability to try things over and over again and build muscle memory is really, really powerful. We've also used this neuroscience research to look at customer experience. So also at Lowe's, when the light bulb changed, as the light bulb category has gotten greener over the past decade, it's gotten way more complicated. So I don't know if any of you have bought a light bulb recently, but if you find yourself in the aisle of a light bulb, it's pretty difficult. And they range from very inexpensive to very expensive, and it's hard to tell what you need and when. And so this had actually been the top performing category at Lowe's before um, the new incandescent laws took effect. And this category plummeted because people just would give up and leave the store. And so we were able to take the neuroscience technology and look at how people were shopping that shelf, where we were losing them, and as a result, we're able to reorganize instead of grouping everything by brand to group them by product function. And that not only got the category back to where it needed to be, but they started to see growth again in something that you would really consider to be a commodity, which is pretty amazing. Another um, client that we've worked with in the toy space was having a hard time convincing their retail partners why they were different from some of the competition. And they were really specifically focused on pop culture and fandom, which is a very difficult idea to communicate. And so we did some testing with them um, in a retail environment to look at how people were shopping their products, which showed up in multiple categories across the store. And the results that we found not only showed when people were having a positive or a negative experience, but we could pinpoint the exact moment in your brain when you went from a browse mode into a product selection mode. And what was happening to help you get to that choice and how quickly you got to that choice. Um, and really we saw, and this is something we see over and over and over again, that within the first 15 seconds that a consumer is standing at the aisle, They'd either made a decision that they wanted to get something and they've moved into like real purchase decision mode or they've moved on and they're not interested at all. And so our client in this case was able to take this research back as a currency to their retail partners and explain to them where people were shopping their products, why they were popular, and they were able to double their square footage space in the store with that retailer. So we did something recently in our lab at um, SU's headquarters in Santa Clara where we just wanted to take a look at the Can Lion Award winners from this year. Um, and see if we would have come to the same conclusion as the judges if we were using neuroscience as the basis of our decisions. And so we looked at some of the top uh, award winners in the film category. So this was the actual winner here. This was a, a film that the New York Times put out. Um, we also looked at some ads for uh, different, there's a, a public service campaign around school shootings. We looked at um, a Nike ad. There's an Apple ad, and finally, an Old Spice ad, the endless ad. You may remember that from the Super Bowl. And we had people watch these advertisements while they were wearing the EEG set that our friend Matt in the back is wearing here today. Um, and then we also paired that with you know, traditional responses in a survey to see what their reactions were. And we actually would have made some changes to the award winners based on what we learned, um, where we would have recommended that the Generation Lockdown ad was the winner. And actually, we wouldn't have awarded Old Spice an ad uh, award at all. And what we saw in the Generation Lockdown um, ad is that there is such a strong and compelling narrative here. And you're really introduced as a surprise to some children who are now teaching adults about how to prepare for a lockdown because they have done so many lockdown drills in their school. 
And there's some very compelling emotional moments in there of crisis that really draw you in. Um, but importantly, by the end of the ad, you've also resolved those feelings for the viewer. So like I mentioned earlier, motivation can sometimes indicate a fear response. So what you're seeing here is um, cognitive workload is this yellow measure. So we're kind of in this middle band here, which is that whelmed space that we want to see you in, not underwhelmed, not overwhelmed. Um, and then the green line is actually where we're looking at engagement and motivation. It's really, really high here because people are actually kind of revulsed by what they saw in, in moments of this ad. But by the time it resolved at the end, they had come back around. It was very, very motivating for these people to take action on what they saw. And so this, um, here we saw some of the ads in the middle just didn't stand out, for, but it may not be why you think. So the New York Times ad also had a pretty compelling story, but we saw they just made some creative choices that made it difficult for people to make att pay attention. There was audio and visual cues that came in at very distracting points, and that just detracted from the overall performance of the ad. The Apple and Nike ads, kind of a similar story here. There was nothing really bad that we saw, but there was nothing really good either. There just wasn't anything that stood out about it one way or the other. It kind of met expectations, or it just tried to be all things to all people, and it didn't really seem to stick. And what was really interesting when we got to the Old Spice ad, which I think is about a five minute long ad, is people really, really liked it up to a point, at which point they completely hated it. And so humor gets you to a certain point, but it's not the end all be all. And we could have told them exactly when to stop the ad and it really would have performed well. So I think um, our hypothesis going into it was that the Cannes Festival can be kind of an insular audience and they sort of pick their friends. And, and so this might be a case where, you know, an, a really long advertisement might be funny to advertisers, but not so much to their consumers. And so what the neuroscience did in this case, when we combined it with what people told us, is it let us avoid some assumptions. Yes, narratives are powerful, but as we saw in the New York Times ad, you can make distractive decisions that take away from the power of that narrative. So it's not the only thing that matters. Um, those creative elements are really important to keep in mind, whether you're marketing or whether you're building a new application. I mean, making things intuitive and seamless is something we see over and over and over again. Um, and then being able to pinpoint these exact time frames when people disengaged, or in the case of our toy client, the exact moment when they moved into purchase mode is really, really powerful data. And so this is the kind of tool that you can use to look at new ideas, new concepts. We've tested sales pitches. Uh, we've looked at new pricing models, um, all of the product development work. There's lots of lots of ways that you can apply this kind of technology. Um, to, to really help make experiences better for people and keep them engaged like you want them to. Thank you very much.